Water Street Books and the Exeter Historical Society, and it is great to be here. Tonight's author is Erica Armstrong Dunbar. She is the Blue and Gold Professor of Black Studies and History at the University of Delaware. In 2011, Professor Dunbar was appointed the first director of the program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. She's been the recipient of Ford Mellon and SSRC fellowships and is an organization of American historians' distinguished lecturer. Tonight's book is about Oni Judge. You might have heard of her. We've discussed her here at the Exeter Historical Society before. Oni Judge was part of a small but significant black population living in New Hampshire just after the Revolutionary War. We had a larger African American presence in New Hampshire and in Exeter in the 19th century than we do even today. It's a very underserved part of our history. Oni was able to escape enslavement from her owners, George and Martha Washington. Yes, that George Washington. <laughs> Although she was considered a dower slave and was owned um, officially by Martha Washington. Ms. Dunbar will be telling us more of her story, although, spoiler, the book is called Never Caught. <laughs> so, you should read it. Um, the story starts in Virginia and ends in Greenland, New Hampshire. And I warn you, it might ruin your image of our first president. Martha Washington doesn't really come out of this well either. Um, along the way, there's a lot of familiar names from the Seacoast region. You're going to hear about Tobias Lear, the Whipple family, the Jacks. And you will also hear, uh, there should also be a shout out to all of the many nameless people who aided Oni as she hid in plain sight. So please welcome Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Barbara for a great introduction, and um, I bothered Barbara about two years ago. I'm gonna put my water down here. Um, I came in, I was finishing up some research on the book, and I came in to look at some newspapers that only, that I could only find here. And she was so kind and so helpful and um, didn't know, I don't think I told you what project I was working on at the time, and um, being uh, closed now in the archives. Um, but thank you for your help then uh, and for a great introduction. So applause to you. <laughs> to the Exeter Historical Society, which um, you know helps scholars like myself and graduate students um, to recast and rethink the history of our nation. Um, so historical societies and archives are very dear to my heart. There's no way I can do the work that I do uh, without them. So maybe now is when I ask to pass the hat. No, just <laughs> support your support history. Um, so thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about um, how I sort of came to writing this book. Uh, to give some context, I'll read a bit. Uh, from the book as well, and um, to, to we'll have some time for Q and A. How long am I? What's, what's my schedule here? What are we doing? Okay. I'm flexible. I, I, you know, I can I can give you what you need. So 40 minutes is good, and then we'll do some Q and A. We'll leave time, 20 minutes or so, for um, questions and comments. About 20 years ago. I was completing a bit of research. I was finishing my dissertation, which would become my first book, uh, A Fragile Freedom, which was about how black women became free in the North. And I was working uh, in the archives. I was at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and um, wanted to kind of get an idea of what everyday life was looking like in Philadelphia at the end of the 18th century. So the best thing to do always is to look at newspapers. What, what are people talking about in print at that time? Their version of Facebook, <laughs> Twitter. So I was looking through um, the newspapers and I came across um, a newspaper advertisement. And it was an advertisement for a runaway slave. And you know, in the 1790s, that wasn't particularly odd or rare, even in a place like 
like Philadelphia, where slavery was sort of on its deathbed. I thought, OK, well, here's a, uh, an ad for a runaway. But then I read further, and I realized that this ad was for someone who had escaped the house of the President of the United States. I said, like, OK, wait a minute. Do you want that? 1796, that's George. OK. Who ran away from George and Martha Washington? And of course, uh, she was named in the advertisement Oni Judge. And I'll talk a little bit about her name in a bit and why I actually chose to call her Ona Judge, which is the name that she went by at the end of her life. So I chose to use Ona as opposed to Oni, which appears constantly throughout the Washington's ledger books and what have you. But I used Ona as a sort of marker of adult dignity. Um, and the name that she chose uh, to go by at the end of her life. So you'll see both Ona and Oni used uh, when talking about this amazing woman. So I was in the archives, I'm reading this, this advertisement, and I say, why don't I know this story? Here I am, supposedly becoming an expert, getting a PhD in early African American women's history, American history uh, more broadly, but I don't know this name. That troubles me. And I thought, oh, well, I'll come back to her. I'm, I'm going to, maybe I can find a way to add her in the dissertation. I said, yeah, no, I can't. I'm going to come back to her. And that's sort of what I did. So I uh, finished the dissertation, the first book, and then I came back. I sort of vowed uh, to return to her story. And it would lead me on a nine year trail of researching and writing um, about the life of one of the most incredible women I've encountered in the archives. So tonight I'll bring, I'll offer a bit of context, I'll show some slides, pictures are always a good thing. Uh, and I'll read, as I said, I'll read a bit from the book. Spring rain drenched the streets of Philadelphia in 1796. Weather in the city of brotherly love was often fickle at this time of year. Vacillating between extreme cold and oppressive heat, but rain was almost always appreciated in the nation's capital. It erased the putrid smells of rotting food, of animal waste and filth that permeated the cobblestone roads of the new nation. It reminded Philadelphians that the long and punishing winter was behind them. Spring rain cleansed the streets and souls of Philadelphians. It ushered in optimism and a feeling of rebirth. And in the midst of the promises of spring, Ona Judge, a young, black, enslaved woman, received devastating news. She learned that she was to leave Philadelphia a city that had become her home. Judge was to travel back to her birthplace of Virginia and prepare herself to be bequeathed to her owner's granddaughter. Tonight I'll introduce one, what I argue is one of the most understudied fugitive slaves in America. At the age of 22, Judge stole herself from the Washingtons forcing the president to show his slave-catching hand. And as a fugitive, judge would test the president's will, his reputation. The most important man in the nation, heralded with winning the American Revolution, could not reclaim his enslaved woman. Ona Judge did what very few people could do. She beat the president. Ona Judge was never caught. And Barb sort of uh, hinted at this, at the, the title, the spoiler. So I was finished, I finished uh, writing the book. And that's sort of when you really start talking about titles. But I had actually always worked with the working title of Never Caught. My editor liked it. We took it to marketing. They were like, we hate it, Erica. <laughs> it's just a non start. And I was like, well, what's the problem? They're like, you're giving the story away. I said, well, you know, that didn't hurt 12 years a slave or death of a salesman. <laughs> 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 Clearly, I won the argument, right? Um, but I do think I wanted. I also 
told marketing that the reason I wanted to use the title Never Caught, because they were sort of pushing me to use words like free and freedom and things like that. The reality was that Nona Judge was never free. She remained a fugitive uh, for the entirety of her life once she left Philadelphia. And I thought that was a very important distinction. And she lived a very long year, long life. I'll try not to spoil too much. I'll, I'll be careful with what I say in case some of you still want to read and be surprised. But um, she lived a very long life as a fugitive. And I think that's very important with the book to sort of understand what it meant to live with this on your shoulders, living in the shadows um, as a person on the run. I, um, I always try, this is an image of Mount Vernon. It's a later image from 1872. There are earlier um, pictures of uh, Mount Vernon. Um, this is one of the more sort of crisp and clean and when I'm teaching my students, you know, they like pictures. And I, I also want to, to make it very clear that, that this is the home, this is the place uh, where Ona Judge was born and for a good many years um, was raised. I introduce what I argue is a new American hero, an enslaved girl raised at Mount Vernon who once exposed to the ideas of freedom was compelled to pursue it at any cost. This was a woman who found the courage to defy the President of the United States, the wit to find allies, to escape, to outnegotiate, to run, to survive. One of the things that's so important about Ona's story is that her testimony is the only existing account we have of a fugitive from the Washingtons. So she leaves behind two interviews at the end of her life, one of which I came to look at here years ago. Um, and it's really the only um, evidence of that sort of an enslaved person who lived and uh, worked at Mount Vernon. We know stories of others here in Washington and then others who ran off specifically when, uh, during the American Revolution. But she's the only one that left behind sort of a testimony, an interview or two. We believe that her account is the only fugitive account from an enslaved person in 18th century Virginia. So Judge's life exposes the sting of slavery, the drive of defiance. She guarded her freedom, or what she believed to be her freedom, every day of her life never regretting her decision to fight for what she believed to be her right, and that was freedom. And so some of the time that I spent researching this book was spent doing sort of genealogy work, um, which is some of the most difficult, painstaking work to do, especially for the enslaved. Um, at Mount Vernon in particular, very few people had surnames, uh, we don't have a record of birth dates for the most part. We do have census records, and I was able to find tax accounts that um, allowed me to piece together Ona's life, her family, and that story. Ona was born sometime, 1773-74, uh, at Mount Vernon. As Barbara said, she was a part of what we call a dower estate. Her mother, Betty, was technically owned by Martha Washington. So. Martha Washington, married one time before George, her husband died, left her a very wealthy woman in the Chesapeake with a significant number of enslaved people. So when George Washington marries Martha, he actually sort of comes up a little bit instead. He, she, she's the one with the, the money um, and slaves. And he was born into uh, a slaveholding family, uh, but really Martha was the one with more significant wealth. And she would come eventually to Mount Vernon after they married, and she would bring Ona Judge's mother, Betty, with her. Betty brought her small son, son Austin, who was a toddler. Uh, and it's a moment where we get to see an enslaved woman do what very few people were able to do, and that was to hold on to her child uh, when she was moving from one location to the next. Over some years, 
Uh, Betty would become one of the most sort of talented seamstresses and spinners at Mount Vernon. And at some point, she encountered Andrew Judge. I don't know when, I don't know what the nature of their relationship was. Andrew Judge was a white indentured servant. And Washington had purchased his indenture agreement in Baltimore uh, in 72, 1772. He was a tailor and known for making some of the most sort of important uh, uniforms that Washington wore during the Revolution. He was a tailor and he was a seamstress. I don't know if their relationship was consensual, if it was violent. What I do know is that it resulted in the birth of Ona Judge. Um, Andrew Judge was the only person at Mount Vernon with the last name of Judge and the only person in all of Fairfax County with the last name of Judge. Um, and all throughout the Washington's ledgers and record books, uh, Ona is referred to as Oni Judge. So she's one of the few at Mount Vernon who has a sort of notation of parentage of a father um, who is a white indentured servant. Nonetheless, she remained Martha Washington's uh, part of that dower lineage. At the age of 10, Ona would uh, be brought up from where sort of enslaved children lived to the mansion house. Uh, and she would follow her mother's footsteps in becoming a seamstress and a spinner, and over time sort of works up to this position of really becoming Martha Washington's sort of top slave for the uh, lack of a better term. And she was responsible for the most intimate of duties, helping Martha Washington bathe, brushing her hair, helping her with her clothing. And so she moves up the ranks really as a teenager. Uh, and as I said, becomes Martha Washington's uh, top slave. In 1789, George Washington was elected president of the United States. This is an image of Federal Hall on Wall Street where George Washington gave, um, uh, took his oath of office and waved to the crowd, gave a little speech. Um, and what was really sort of interesting about this moment in 1789 is that he goes to New York, the site of the nation's capital, and um, he goes alone. Martha Washington does not go with him. She didn't want to move. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she, she had no concerns. Um, they had spent a great deal of time apart during the American Revolution. Um, they had sort of settled into a way of life. All of her family were all in Virginia, and she didn't want to go. And she would refer to her days eventually in the North as the lost days. Um, she was unhappy. She worried about George Washington's health. Um, and so she actually, as I said, didn't go uh, to his inauguration, was left at home to pack up and prepare for the move. And so reading the letters from Tobias, from New Hampshire's to uh, Tobias Lear to Martha Washington, where it was kind of funny. He was trying to entice her. He said, we have a great cook food's great, and you know, these things that he thought would sort of lure a reluctant first lady um, to New York. Eventually, George and Martha Washington would travel, eventually live in New York, and they would take seven enslaved people with them, five men, two women, and Ona Judge was one of them. She would be taken from her mother Betty and her other siblings that remained in Virginia. And I'll read a bit from the book about this moment that uh, Ona leaves Mount Vernon. The young Ona judge was far from an experienced traveler. The teenager knew only Mount Vernon and its surroundings and had never traveled far from her family and loved ones. For judge, the move must have been similar to the dreaded auction block. Although she was not to be sold to a different owner, she was forced to leave her family for an unfamiliar destination, 
hundreds of miles away. Judge would have no choice but to stifle the terror she felt and to go on about the work of preparing to move. Folding linens, packing Martha Washington's dresses and her personal accessories, helping the grandchildren were the tasks at hand. And it was her, wasn't her place to complain or question. Judge had to remain strong and steady, if not for herself, then for her mistress who appeared to be falling apart at the seams. Like Judge, Martha Washington had no choice about the move to New York. Her life was at the direction of her husband, who was now the most powerful man in the new country. Mrs. Washington and Ona Judge may have shared similar concerns, but of course only Martha Washington was allowed to express discontent and sorrow. Martha Washington was unhappy, and everyone knew it, including her frightened slave. The president's nephew, Robert Lewis, would also soon be made aware of it. When he arrived at the estate on May 14th, things were in disarray. Lewis, who served as Washington's secretary between 1789 and 91, was chosen to escort his aunt to her grandchildren to New York, but was surprised and a bit concerned when he arrived to find a frenzied and hectic scene, Lewis wrote, quote, everything appeared to be in confusion, end quote. The manifestation of Mrs. Washington's conflicting feelings. Robert Lewis described the departure which finally took place on May 16, 1789, as an emotional moment for the enslaved and the first lady, quote, after an early dinner, and making all necessary arrangements, in which we were greatly retarded. It brought us to three o'clock in the afternoon when we left Mount V. The servants of the house and a number of the field Negroes made their appearance to take leave of their mistress. Numbers of these poor wretches seemed greatly agitated, much affected, my aunt equally so, end quote. Betty, Ona Judge's mother, must have been one of those agitated slaves. Not only was she losing her 16-year-old daughter, but she was also losing her son Austin, who would serve as one of the Washington's waiters. Austin's wife Charlotte and their children would have joined in the morning. Betty watched her children leave Mount Vernon, a reminder of what little control enslaved mothers had over the lives of their children. If she found any comfort that day, it would have been that brother and sister were traveling together. Austin was older and male and could look out for his younger sister. Still, Betty knew that her relationship with her children would never be the same. And it's at this moment a 16-year-old um, owner judge leaves for New York. Um, and one of the things that is sort of fascinating about Ona's life and allowed me um, to sort of get at a larger story, which was the story, as I had in the title of today's presentation, um, The Founding of the Nation Through the Eyes of the Enslaved, Ona moves quite a bit uh, during her life, or at least the early years of her life. And so her move from Virginia eventually to New York uh, was the first sort of leg of that. So she moves, this is her first time in a major sort of northern city where slavery was on the wane, but still very present. So there were over 20,000 enslaved people in New York. Uh, when she arrives in 1789. So all of those sort of major politicians and well-known people, they owned slaves. So it wasn't a rarity for the Washingtons, or an oddity rather, for the Washingtons to bring enslaved people with them uh, to serve. But her time in New York and, uh, was relatively short. So this is the moment where pop culture helps historians like myself because uh, never before have I had students that have known so much about the early republic thanks to Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> they know about this deal that's going on between uh, Jefferson and Hamilton and, and this sort of decision.
decision about the nation's capital makes my life a little bit easier in the classroom. I don't play the soundtrack, though. Um, but the move was um, in no November of 1790, so it was a relatively short stay in New York, and then we moved to Philadelphia, which would be the site of the nation's capital for the next uh, 10 years. Um, and Ona would live there until 1796. So really, she sort of came of age in Philadelphia. Um, here's an image of the president's house in Philadelphia. If you are familiar, if you've been there, you've seen the sort of Liberty Bell. Um, it's right next to where the Liberty Bell is right now on Market Street. Um, I show this image. This is like a lithograph from much later, 1830s or so. But um, we believe a sort of close replica of what the house looked like. I show this to my students because I want them to understand what a president's house looked like in the 18th and 19th century. The sort of notion of a White House of sprawling um, uh, home was not what we we're talking about. So when we're thinking, looking at this image right here, we have the Washingtons living there, two of their grandchildren that come to live as well. Uh, at this point, nine enslaved people, the number ticks up a bit when they move to Philly. Teams of servants and secretaries and their family <laughs> living in Tobias Lear's uh, wife and before she, she died from the old fever and uh, their son lived here. So this house was sort of bursting at the seams, right? This was a late 18th century president's house. And when, when Ona arrives in Philadelphia, it's a very different space than New York. She comes as an enslaved person, and she is in the minority, the clear minority. There are over 6,000 free blacks living in Philadelphia, and only about 100 enslaved people. So she's the oddball, right? And the, and the president um, has brought her. And so why is she the minority? Why has, is Philadelphia looking so, or Pennsylvania looking so very different from New York? Well, legislation changed uh, in the 1780s that really began to dismantle slavery. And Pennsylvania in 1780 passed a Gradual Abolition Act, which basically said, if you had slaves after March 1st, 1780, they can only be held for up to 28 years. Not only, because in, especially at that time, that's half your life, or maybe more than half your life. But what it does is begin the sort of dismantling of slavery over time. So that by the time that Ona gets to Philadelphia, slavery is really on its deathbed. And the other piece of this legislation that becomes so problematic for the Washingtons had to do with those who were non-residents who came to Pennsylvania. So the law basically stated that if you were a non-resident and you came to Pennsylvania and you brought your slaves, you could only stay for six months. And after six months, your slaves could be set free. So the Attorney General goes to Washington and says, look, we have a problem. Yeah, he's actually right. Washington's off in a southern tour, and he comes and he actually talks to Martha, who's at home, and later to Tobias Lear, and he says, look, I've lost some of my slaves. They found out about the law, uh, and so you may want to sort of think about this um, and find a way around it, if possible. And it's at this moment that uh, George Washington and Martha Washington, in consultation with Tobias Leader, come up with a slave rotation plan. And so every six months, the Washingtons would rotate their slaves back to Virginia. And if they couldn't get to Virginia, a trip to Trenton over the river would basically reset the clock on slavery. And so, you know, this is one of those moments in the archives where I'm like, George, really? Like, wow. Um, okay. And when I read his letter in which he wrote, quote, I wish to have it accomplished under the pretext that may deceive both them, the enslaved, and the public, end quote, double wow. Just sort of like, okay. So you knew. Um, this was no sort of coinkinink. You planned this. You and Martha Washington and Tobias Lear followed um, the, the rules. Uh, and so it was a moment where the Washingtons weren't necessarily breaking the law, but they were breaking the spirit of the law. 
right? And sort of rotating. And this went on for the next six years while Ona uh, was there. And so she would go back and forth between Mount Vernon and Philadelphia, or sometimes to New Jersey. Um, and this slave rotation plan was in effect. But what it could not do was remove Ona from a city in which black freedom was very visible. So she walked on the streets and she would see black entrepreneurs selling their fruits and their vegetables and their oysters. And she would watch Mother Bethel Church being built around the corner. Black freedom was palpable. It was visible. She went to the circus. She went to the theater. These were things she never would have experienced in Virginia, but all in a place where black freedom was the norm by the time she arrived. And there was no way that the president could keep her from this as much as he tried. They were very vigilant uh, with the enslaved, uh, but he couldn't erase black freedom. Nor was he willing to um, live without slaves in the North. Because the first thing I asked myself was, well, why, why don't you just have servants? Why don't you just sort of fit in, get yourself some white servants, boom, you don't have to worry about sort of uh, the feelings and the sentiments of Philadelphians. Um, and he wrote, actually, that he just didn't want them. He, he, he complained about them being lazy, and you know, they weren't, um, uh, they didn't look as clean as his enslaved people. So these interesting notions from sort of Virginians about uh, what service and service should look like. And he preferred his people this would be how Ona would live. Uh, and it wasn't until 1796 where uh, a, a sort of number of dramatic events happened that would change the course of her life. February, 1796. There was an unease in the executive mansion in Philadelphia. A thick tension prompted Ona Judge and her enslaved companions to tread lightly around the Washington. Enslaved men and women always moved about their days with caution, not knowing what events could sour or sweeten an owner's mood. For the enslaved who resided within the same walls as their owner, life could be akin to walking through fields embedded with landmines. The smallest of matters, such as the accidental breaking of a dish, or inconveniently timed bad weather could alter the disposition of an owner. Although the president had not earned a reputation of being a violent or physically punishing slave owner, he did, on occasion, lose his temper and wrote back and forth to his estate manager uh, about correcting difficult slaves. So Ona Judge maneuvered through her daily tasks in February with a sort of watchful eye. She watched her mistress. Uh, she knew Martha Washington well. And what I try to do in the book is to show the, um, the complexity of, of everyone, of Ona Judge, of George Washington, of Martha Washington as well. Martha was a woman who lived through great sorrow and tragedy. She lost her first husband, married, and she would lose every single one of her children really up through young adulthood. So from the age of, of infancy up through young adulthood, she lost all of her children. And she really only had her grandchildren to look to uh, for sort of excitement and joy. And they actually brought two grandchildren to live with the Washingtons in New York and Philadelphia as an attempt to raise them. An interesting note, um, George and Martha Washington never had children. So George Washington had no biological children. And I think that becomes important later on when we think about um, some of the things he chose to do regarding his will and inheritance. They were 27 years old when they married. Uh, but, and Martha had children, but they never would. And this must have been difficult. And, and uh, Ona Judge knew how much her 
mistress doted upon her grandchildren. This is one of her grandchildren, hopefully you can see the image, Eliza Park Custis Law. She didn't come actually to live with uh, the Washington. She was a little older. She stayed back in Virginia. I like this image because this was a, a portrait done by Gilbert Stewart. And um, the, the sort of lore was that uh, Gilbert Stewart was doing a portrait of the president. And uh, Eliza burst into the room and was sort of annoyed. And um, Gilbert Stewart liked that sort of image of her better and chose to paint her. Uh, and so we get this, this portrait of her. But I, I think it tells us a little bit about her personality. Um, and uh, a woman that Honor Judge would come to know. On February 6th, the mail arrived in Philadelphia with a letter from Eliza in which she told the president and Mrs. Washington that she was going to get married. They knew nothing about this. Her father was deceased. In many ways, George Washington was sort of a surrogate. And she wrote to ask for their approval. The man she was marrying was Thomas Law. He was an English businessman. He, had, he was 20 years older than she. He had spent a significant time in India and came to America in the early 1790s and brought with him two of his three biracial children. He had an Indian mother. So all this was sort of just wild card material for the Washingtons. And I was sort of <laughs> snooping through the letters of, um, uh, from, of their peers. I'm reading through John Adams' letters to Abigail. He writes about this. This is like the TMZ of the day, right? The gossip, and he's like, "Oh yes, Martha's pretending to be happy about Betsy, cover Betsy, Betsy getting married to this rather older gentleman um, who has these swarthy children." And so there's all this sort of um, like, "Ooh, there's something going on there." But Eliza had this reputation for being sort of volcanic. Um, she was a woman who knew what she wanted or thought she knew what she wanted and didn't really care about um, what was customary. She would come to Philadelphia, she refused to go to church, and Martha Washington would be like, oh, and George thought it was funny, and, um, <laughs> but that was, you know, that was her reputation. So in many ways, when she writes to them and says, will you please give your acceptance to this, this marriage, um, it was shocking, but perhaps not so much. And eventually, Washington writes back and he says, well, this is what you want. You know, please don't go to England and stay here and good luck and come visit us in Philadelphia. So in March, they marry, March 21st, 1796. And this marriage <coughs> signals the beginning of major changes in the Washington's household, especially for Ona Judge. At this moment, we have the marriage of Eliza. We have this moment where Washington has decided he's not going to run for a third term in office. The public doesn't know, but the family knows. And um, so there's the enslaved at, in Philadelphia knew that eventually they would be returning to Mount Vernon. And the idea of reconnecting with loved ones in Virginia must have given some of the enslaved reason to celebrate but Judge had lived in the North for seven years, and the thought of returning to Mount Vernon did not settle well. A return to Mount Vernon was a reminder to Judge and her enslaved companions that they were considered the property of another person. And after living in a free Northern city, this was a difficult concept to swallow. For Ona Judge, however, the uncertainty vanished as her fate was revealed. The marriage of Eliza Custis and the change in circumstances, life circumstances, would cut Judge's residency in Philadelphia short. Unlike the other slaves in the executive mansion, Ona Judge would not return to Philadelphia from her annual summer sojourn to Mount Vernon. She would not be around to witness the president's final months in office. And why was that? Martha Washington's deep concern for her granddaughter trumped any relationship that she may have forged with Judge. Sensing that Eliza had entered into a marriage, 
for which she was unprepared, the First Lady made a decision that would help her granddaughter navigate through the transition. She would give Ona Judge to Eliza Custis. Although Ona had earned the top spot among Martha's personal slaves, there was no way for Judge to convince her owner to change her mind. And Judge's fate was now in the hands of Eliza Custis Law, who was known for being a somewhat volatile person. She was approximately the same age uh, as Ona. And a ship to her household uh, would most likely doom Judge to a life of poor treatment and uncertainty. And she simply couldn't let that happen. I'll read a bit from the book in terms of her decision making around this this moment. This is and this is in the book, this is what I argue is sort of the trigger. So they're culminating um, factors is the fact that she's living around her blacks, there's a change in um, life circumstances. President Washington is going to leave office and now the issue of going to work for uh, and live with Eliza Custis Law changes Ona's thought pattern uh, and makes some decisions for her. Judge knew what the future held should she not heed the advice of her free black associates. Quote, she supposed if she went back to Virginia, she should never have a chance to escape, end quote. Once she learned that, quote, upon the decease of her master and mistress, she would become the property of a granddaughter of theirs by the name of Custis, end quote, she knew that she had to flee. She imagined that her work for the laws would begin immediately, not after the death of her owners, prompting a fierce clarity about her future and her dislike for Eliza Custis. Quote, she was determined never to be her slave, end quote. Her decision was made. She would risk everything to avoid the clutches of the new Mrs. Law. Judge was well informed and knew that her decision to flee was far more than risky, but still she was willing to face dog sniffing kidnappers and bounty hunters for the rest of her life. Yes, her fear was consuming, but so too was her anger. Judge could no longer stomach her enslavement, and it was the change in her ownership that pulled the trigger on Judge's fury. She had given everything to the Washingtons. For 12 years, she had served her mistress faithfully, and now she was to be discarded like the scraps of material that she cut from Martha Washington's dresses. Any false illusions she had clung to had evaporated, and Judge knew that no matter how obedient or loyal she may have appeared to her owners, she would never be considered fully human. Her fidelity meant nothing to the Washingtons. She was their property to be sold, mortgaged, or treated with whomever they wished. And this is the moment when uh, Ona Judge makes this decision to run. And so here's one of the, oh, it's a little dark, but this is one of the um, runaway slave advertisements that I came across uh, 20 years ago. This one appeared in Claypool's American Daily Advertiser. The one I actually saw was in the Philadelphia Gazette. And so what was interesting was that uh, Ona Judge would make up her mind, decide to leave the president's household, and on May 21st, 1796, she ran off while they ate their supper, <clears throat> and she would never return. These, this is one of the ads that ran. The Washingtons uh, ran this advertisement for uh, about a week in the newspapers. And what I thought was so very interesting was that uh, this is one of the few places we have a description 
of Ona, quote, absconded from the household of the President of the United States on Saturday afternoon, Oni judge, a light mulatto girl, much freckled with very black eyes and bushy black hair. She's of middle stature, slender and delicately made, about 20 years of age. And uh, in this advertisement, which is so interesting, you see how the Washingtons really believed themselves to be um, benevolent slaveholders. The ad read, um, this is the part that always sort of makes me say, really? Um, as there was no suspicion of her going off, and it happened without the least provocation, it is not easy to conjecture whether she is gone or fully what her design is. And so that, that phrase, as there was no suspicion of her going off, and it happened without the least provocation. Okay, she was a slave. That's probably, you know, that's enough to provoke anyone um, to perhaps run off. But it's a reminder that, you know, the Washingtons believed themselves to be um, kind owners, paternalistic, um, in which that they, they took care of their slaves. And I think Ona's story sort of tells us something very different. For years, uh, George Washington refused to believe that Ona um, ran off on her own. He believed, he wrote several times that it was a, a crazed Frenchman who was responsible for <laughs> dragging, the French, right? or responsible for dragging her off to New Hampshire. And Ona never ever says this, right, in um, any of her the, the correspondence, or rather interviews that we have left behind, nor could I find any sort of evidence of this happening. But he believed it up until the end of his life. So the second part of the book, uh, I won the battle with never caught, but the second part of the title was, this was my uh, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave. And this is, I think, one of the moments I'm trying not to talk too much about it, and I'll do it in Q&A, and I want to leave something for you all to think about. Um, Ona Judge would be hunted um, by the Washingtons really for the rest of the Washingtons' living years. George Washington died and surprised, uh, sort of unexpectedly in December of 1799, and there was correspondence as late as September of 1799 when he was still trying to reclaim her. So he, he would attempt to pursue her for the rest of his life as president and then later on as a private citizen. And he would lean on federal appointees to do his bidding. Hey, we've heard that story before. So, <laughs> Secretary of the Treasury, <clears throat> customs collector, family members, were all used to try and bring on a back. And I won't sort of give away all of this uh, information so that you have something to think about with the book. But I think what's so sort of powerful is that when Ona runs away, she arrives in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I thought, you know, at first I was like, Portsmouth? Portsmouth's a lovely place, don't get me wrong. I spent a lot of time here over the past couple of years, but I thought, what an unusual place for fugitives. Why not New York? Why not Boston? Like, those are the sort of usual suspects. And, of course, she couldn't go to New York. She was a known entity. People who knew the Washingtons knew Ona. Ona would go everywhere with Martha Washington. She was a recognizable face. And perhaps the same was true in Boston with lots of connections. And so Ona says that it's um, her free black associates that make the decision that she's to arrive in, to go to Portsmouth. And in her um, interviews, she's careful not to name names. And she says it's her free black associates that help her plan this escape. But she gives me one name, she gives us John Bowles, right, who's from Portsmouth, who's the sea captain of the ship that would ferry her to freedom. And so that one name, that's the moment, you know, as, a, as an historian, you, you grab onto that name and you find out everything you possibly can. And what I did was find out about his business as, um, as a ship captain. And he had a shipping business that uh, had him really move from Portsmouth to New York to Philadelphia, and he would bring saddles and candles 
and molasses and coffee, and he would trade these goods, and he would go to Philadelphia, and sometimes he would take passengers back for extra money, and guess, and of course, I'm tracking him and his ships through newspapers and through um, ship logs, and guess who was in Philadelphia at the end of May? John Bowles, which confirms Ona's uh, testimony years later. And he's back in Portsmouth in early June. Uh, so it confirms this, what she argues, in, or what she states in her interviews later on in her life. Uh, that John Bowles was indeed, she, she boarded the ship, the Nancy, because that's the name of the ship that was in port. And she made her way to Portsmouth. And it would really be here in um, New Hampshire that she would spend the majority of her life. We often think about Ona Judge, those of us who know the story, as, oh, the Washington's runaway slave, oh, Mount Vernon, oh, Philadelphia. Well, in reality, Ona spent the next half a century here in New Hampshire. Close to 50 years, she outlived everyone. She outlived the Washingtons, many of their grandchildren, or Martha Washington's grandchildren. And during those 50 years, she would spend her life, for the most part, in seclusion, in the forest. Once she left Portsmouth, um, she went to Greenland uh, and spent the remaining years of her life there. And although she lived in hiding, and really a fugitive's best weapon is anonymity, and although she hid for the majority of her life, I sort of know that she didn't want to be forgotten. And so what I'm hoping is that this book allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us entry into her life, to witness her, her insane amount of courage and bravery and her strategy as a young enslaved woman. But it also gives us a portal into understanding the beginning of the nation through the eyes of the enslaved. And I wanted to tell this story, the beginning of the country, the founding of the nation, not through founding father's eyes or this sort of top-down story that we're kind of used to, but really through the eyes of an enslaved woman who moves from Virginia to New York to Pennsylvania, then to New Hampshire, sort of covering the new nation. And it's through her life that we have this portal, this entry into those beginning early years of this nation. And I'll end there. Thank you all very much. Questions um, about you know the writing process, about the book, about um, uh, the Washingtons, whatever. So I'm here. Ask questions. Yes. How did Ona Judge support herself when she got to living in Greenland? Great question. So the question is, um, how did she support herself? And I think one of the ways that Ona supports herself is the way that most. Um, enslaved or formerly enslaved fugitives and free people did. She was a domestic. She found work um, in people's homes, uh, was a laundress, and it was a very difficult life. And one of the things I try to do in this book with Ona's life is to juxtapose the life as a southern slave to the life of an enslaved, uh, of a free or fugitive person in the North. And I wanted to kind of dismantle this myth that living became great once you went North, that you follow the North Star and then freedom comes and it's great. And the reality is that we was far from that for fugitives like Ona, but also for people who had never been enslaved or maybe found their way out of slavery through legal emancipation, that you were forced to carry your freedom papers in New Hampshire. 
But slavery doesn't end technically until the 1850s in New Hampshire. And although there was um, a general move against slavery here so very early on, it still lived. Uh, and I wanted through this sort of, uh, through Ona traveling from New York to Philly to New England to be able to tell us that story that life was not easy that it was actually extremely difficult. And so I, get, I go into sort of what a New England winter is like, you know, in the 18th century. And I'll, I'll admit I'm a total chicken. I never came to do any research during the winter. <laughs> that was all that, like, June to August, I, I was too chicken. Um, but one of the things that struck me, you know, sort of thinking about the material goods of people in the 18th century and how life became so very difficult for a significant number of months through the year because of heavy snow and um, uninsulated cabins and what have you, um, that actually has moved lots of readers. So when I came, I did a reading in um, Concord. Uh, maybe two months ago, and a woman approached me and she said, you know, I just, I thought so much about how difficult it was in New England and that Ona was, she was poor. She was desperately impoverished. And I thought about the things she would have wanted and needed in her pantry that she simply didn't have. And this woman actually brought me, she said, I made you some jam from berries that were used in, you know, the 18th century. I'm like, okay. Wow, that is, you know, that's a great person from New Hampshire, New York, they're wonderful people. Um, and dry, dry teas, that these are things that we sort of take for granted, but these were things that were very difficult to come by. In some of the later records in Ona's life, it was clear that she became basically dependent upon um, the charity of others and also the, the town of, of Greenland. So for things like firewood, so I found records that said X amount of firewood donated to or given to uh, the slaves or the, the people at X house. And so something as simple as heating your home, which isn't simple in New England right into the winter, she was completely dependent upon others for it. And so, Part of what the book does is attempt to demonstrate how difficult life was, even though she was, she called herself free. She lived as a free person. She was never free. She was a, a, a fugitive. But her life was difficult. And in many ways, this didn't leave for sort of the happiest of endings, right? It's sort of like, well, she got away, and maybe she was free, and life was hard. Well, yeah. And that's sort of the complicated story, right, of, of slavery and for, for fugitives, for, for most fugitives. Yes? Was Canada ever an option? Yeah, she, she never mentions Canada. And what's interesting is that Canada as um, uh, a sort of haven for, for fugitives really sort of picks up a little bit later on. I think that's the thing to remember is that Ona runs off before there's a, a underground railroad, right? This underground railroad is really a sort of 19th century construction of loosely connected places, safe harbors for those who were running from, from slavery. She's running in 1796, right? So before, decades before Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman, which is another reason why her story is just absolutely amazing. It doesn't mean, of course, there were others who fled before her, and there would be many who fled after her. Um, but she's sort of leaving at this moment she runs off at this moment where the, the talk of Canada isn't as, um, uh, it's not as engaged. We see that much more in the 19th century where uh, Frederick Douglass actually says that um, he would go to his newspaper office and in the morning there would be a dozen uh, fugitives on the doorsteps waiting for him in Rochester to, to help them get to Canada. And so this really becomes a, a sort of 19th century phenomenon. For her, she says, really, she knew it was later on that it would be Boston or Portsmouth. And um, I'm sort of glad it became Portsmouth, because it also helps us think about New Hampshire 
in a way that when we're talking about the story of um, of the enslaved and fugitives doesn't always get the shine maybe that it it deserves. We usually think about Boston, right? Um, but uh, there was quite a bit happening in New England and New Hampshire in particular, um, a place that clearly her free black associates felt she could hide um, and or live. Um, they were right about the living part, not about the hiding part. Yes? Well, once they were a community of ex-slaves there, so that she wasn't totally isolated, yeah. so that's one part. Second part, what were the attitudes of the white people toward these Great people? Great question. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting about when Ona arrives in Portsmouth, um, she arrives in a city that um, has a community of free blacks and some fugitives, uh, but that community is really small. And Barbara mentioned this sort of early on. Uh, the number of black people living in Portsmouth was smaller than the number of black people at Mount Vernon. So we're, we're talking about less than 300 in Portsmouth alone, right? And so when you're thinking about anonymity, it's kind of hard to hide when you're like one of very few people. You're like recognizable as a black person um, in Portsmouth. However, at every turn in all of the correspondence, so there's a lot of correspondence that goes back and forth between the Customs Collective Whipple and uh, the Secretary of the Treasury and Washington that give us hints. They don't give us the names, and I was able to find some names, but clearly there were free blacks that were constantly willing to help fugitives, so that would give them lodging. And so at one point it says she's lodging with a free Negro in Portsmouth, right? Um, and then later on with the Jack family in, um, in Greenland, once again, she was taken in in a sort of um, very sort of crucial moment. So it, it appears to me that there was indeed a community of free blacks who were willing to help and aid fugitives, as well as white men and women who, if they weren't willing to help, they weren't willing to turn them in. And I think that's one of the most incredible things about this narrative is that, you know, from the beginning I was like, well, how come you couldn't get her back? Like he, eventually you know where she is, right? So I won't give that part away. Maybe he knows where she is, you, I'll take that. She, so he finds out, you know, she runs in May, by August, they know where she is. She's spotted by Governor Langdon's daughter. And he writes back to George and tells him, you know, she's here. So he knows where she is. But he, and he thinks he can rely upon the help of um, folks in New Hampshire who supported him during his presidency and his federal appointees, and he's mistaken. And I think part of that has to do with sort of feelings about slavery. We won't call them abolitionists yet because this is the 1790s and sort of too early to label it as such but people who had changing notions or feelings about slavery for a variety of reasons, because of its moral bankruptcy, but also because there was what they called a fugitive problem. So, you know, Whipple, the customs collector, writes to George Washington and says, look, if you southern slaveholders just gradually emancipated your slaves, we wouldn't have this fugitive problem with all these fugitives crossing over and taking our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that people were against slavery or had uh, a level of discomfort. And it moved from religious reasons to sort of moral reasons to financial reasons. Whatever those reasons were, nobody turned her in. And uh, you know, later on in her life, people knew who she was. So usually one of the questions I get is, well, so Washington dies in 1799, so he's you know, that's three years after she runs off. Martha would die shortly after, about 18 months later. Um, do you have any, did they run after her after that? And um, I haven't been able to find any evidence that says that one of the grandchildren uh, came up to New Hampshire looking for her. I, I don't have that um, 
And so, but what I argue is that it doesn't matter, right, that no one's pounding at your door five, eight years later. She knew she was a fugitive. She knew that she was technically owned by Martha Washington's estate. And all of Martha Washington's grandchildren inherited Martha Washington's slaves. So it didn't matter that she was in a free state. It didn't matter that she would go on to marry a free man, and she would. This is one of the, I'll show you an image of uh, something, one of the aha moments that um, this was actually Ona Judge's marriage announcement that appeared in the New Hampshire Gazette in January of 1797, which was amazing to me that it appeared, and clearly everyone who registered to marry, their names were printed in the newspaper. And you can tell she's actually still going by the name Oni, which I argue is the diminutive of her name, like my little Oni. Um, she's still going by Oni, they spell her name differently, Judge, uh, and she married a, a man who's called John sometimes, and was like Jack Staines, who was a free black sailor. And so it didn't matter that she married this free man. She would go on to have children. It didn't matter that their father was free because slavery followed the apron strings of its women. So technically her children then became the property of Martha's grandchildren. And unless there was a document signed that gave them emancipation, they were all fugitives with the exception of the father. And so this is something that Ona lived with. And we can see by the fact that she runs basically to live in the woods for the majority of her life, that she is betting upon anonymity to keep her safe. And it's only until the end of her life, when she reaches the end of her life, where she gives these two interviews, one to the Grant Freeman, which I read here, the newspaper, and one um, to the abolitionist paper, uh, The Liberator, in 1845 and 1847. This is 50 years after she's run off. And it's at this moment that she makes the decision, look, there's nothing left here. You know, I'm an old lady. They're not going to come after me. If they do, they get nothing from me. I can't work. I'm beyond reproductive uh, ability. So now I will tell my story. And it's at this sort of peak of abolitionist movement. So in 1845, when I read her interview in the Grant and Freeman, What's so interesting is that the very next issue, they're talking about this new guy who has this new book out, and his name is Frederick Douglass, right? <laughs> so that's another sort of thing I tell my graduate students, that, hey, you know, don't just read what's right in front of you, right? Read what's in front and what's in back, because it positions Ona then in this abolitionist tradition. Now, whether she would have called herself an abolitionist, I don't, I don't pretend to know that or think that she did. Um, however, she's situated in this sort of line of narratives about enslavement that helped abolitionist communities um, move towards ending slavery. So, um, you know, Ona's life uh, in New Hampshire is critical, it's important, and the community, both black and white, harbor her. Yes, in the back. I'm curious what your relationship is with people at uh, Mount Vernon now, and if they are very defensive of Washington's reputation. I'm just curious. Good question. I was curious too. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I've been there to do some research, but kind of like here, you know, I just go in, I ask to see a few things, you know, try to bring too much attention to yourself. And, and historians do this because one, you don't want someone to steal your idea, right? And part, part you know, when I started this research process, I said, why has nobody written this book already? There were a couple children's books, but why not this? And then sort of three or four years in, I realized, well, I don't know why, because it's hard. She liked it, and finding evidence about her life was very difficult. So I'm going to Mount Vernon, I ask for select things, and I met with a couple of the researchers who were really always very helpful, but I was nervous, I'm not gonna lie. I was nervous when um, the book was about to come out, and I, I, I went to them, and I said, uh, you know, I have this book, it's coming out, um, and, you know, they were super supportive, and the new, maybe it's because the New York Times called and asked if we could do an interview there at Mount Vernon. <laughs> uh, so maybe that helps people act right. I don't think so, though. I think, um, so the Times called and said, Eric, we've come, we're going to do an interview with you on Mount Vernon. I said, okay. 
of course it's okay, right? Um, tell me when. And so I appeared and you know, they're taking the pictures and what have you. And then the day before the book comes out, there's a big spread on it. And I'm standing there with a picture of me and I was totally floored. In front of Mount Vernon, I'm like windswept and you know, about the person Tracy Melvin, a judge of the slave who ran away from the you know, so and this actually gave um, I think Mount Vernon a platform that it's looked for for some time. And I think right now they are actually engaged in grappling with the issue of enslavement. Thirty years before, probably not so much. Now, yes, um, and they have an, an, ex uh, a, an exhibit right now that focuses on Georgia and slavery. So they, they immediately asked me to come and give a book talk and invited C-SPAN to come and they sell the book in the gift shop, so hey. <laughs> You know, this may not be George and Martha Washington's finest hour, right? But this history, this story is important. And Erica deserves to be here. And this book deserves to be here. So I'm happy that we're, we're at this moment with Mount Vernon and other kind of historical institutions um, where we're willing to sort of grapple with the complexity and the difficulties connected to one of the nation's um, long-standing issues around slavery and race. Yes. Fabulous read, by the way. It's Thank very you. well done. Thank you. I wonder if, um, are the places marked in Portsmouth and Greenland? Places where it right. was. Um, the places in Portsmouth are not marked what I was able to find um, was Jack Stains in the census in Portsmouth and the number of people living in his home. So I have that material. It doesn't give me an address. Um, but it does have him as head of household. Uh, of course, it doesn't list Ona because it doesn't list the women. Um, but we know I know from um, birth records of her children who was there and she was there. Greenland, um, it, her, the cottage in which she went to live eventually is on private property. And so the cottage is no longer standing. However, uh, there, are, there were six people who lived in the home. And uh, there was some work done where folks came in with, with sonar. And six bodies were found, uh, detected in the ground. And there's one, um, not a headstone, but a, a sort of flag flagstone um, marker with the name of the owner of the cottage, who was a, 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 a previously enslaved black woman who became free, Phyllis Jack. So her name is marked, but Ona's and the others are not. But I think it's pretty clear that there were six people living in the house, there were six bodies there, Phyllis Jack's there. Um, so I think it's, it's fair to assume that that's Ona's final resting place. Um, her obituary is printed. Ona's obituary appears in the newspaper, in newspapers all over um, New Hampshire and actually down the East Coast. Um, and, you know, so I think it's important. I was careful in the book because it is private property and I'm careful to respect that. Um, uh, yeah, respect that. Yes? Were you able to trace what happened to generations beyond her children and has anyone kind of Great, a question about descendants. Um, and so I'm going to try and do this without killing the story. Um, I could not, I did not find direct descendants of Ona from her children. Um, but what I was able to find, the epilogue of the book um, actually focuses on what happened at Mount Vernon once Ona left. And who was left behind and how that affected them, in particular her siblings. So her sister, um, Philadelphia, her name is Philadelphia, she actually uh, remained, she's a little younger than Ona, and she remained behind at Mount Vernon. And you know, when Martha had to still deal with this issue of who was going to help Eliza, her granddaughter, you know, Ona had blown up the whole plan. This is another moment where you're like, okay. 
Martha. She chose Ona's sister to fill her shoes. So she sends off, um, somebody wants you. Um, she, sends off, um, she sends Philadelphia off to serve Eliza in the federal city in Georgetown. So Ona was right. Ona said, look, we were, I was told that it was going to happen upon the decease of my master, mistress. Mm -hmm. It didn't. It happened immediately, and she knew that it would, because Eliza was, had gotten married. So I, uh, without telling you all of that, I, what I'll say is I was able to track her. And um, I tracked that branch of her family up to the Civil War. Um, and they actually became a fairly well-known um, a fairly well-known black family in D.C., in Washington, D.C. Uh, and there are people who claim to be descendants um, from that branch. And so there's a conversation right now between Mount Vernon and those descendants. There's a whole lot that goes into having to pr you know, prove that you are a descendant, which, you know, that's really hard when you're an enslaved person and you come from a heritage of enslaved slave people who couldn't read, write, or had documents to prove. But there's some material culture items that um, a tea set that was uh, owned by Martha Washington that these people have, and sort of other things. So right now, there's a con I'll say that there's a conversation with, with Matt Vernon. Time for one more question. Yes. yes. But I think um, what you were talking about before when you mentioned the interview she gave when she was older, her three, all three of them, I don't think this is a spoiler. People might wonder that all three of her children by like that time were gone. She told you I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also because, you know, what you said before in terms of their being enslaved, you could understand why she would want to give it Protect. Yeah. yeah, to protect her, her family. And I think that's crucial that to remember that for someone like Ona, once she ran off, it wasn't simply about protecting herself. It then became um, a mission to protect her children, right? Um, and so this is actually an image from part of the newspaper, the Granite Freeman, um, from her interview in, in 1845. And um, she's, it's interesting because at different points, she, she doesn't talk about her children very much. And clearly, it was a sensitive um, issue. And at this moment in Ona's life, um, she, was, she was alone. Um, she managed to outlive, as I said before, uh, almost everyone and so although she was a fugitive although she was sort of living a very difficult life what i tried to do with this book is to show us one way that a person found freedom although it wasn't technically legal freedom she lived as a free person and Another way was through her sister Philadelphia, and I'll let you fill in that part as you read the book, but she manages to find a way to freedom. And I sort of end with the story of um, Ona's niece, who was her namesake, her sister named her Oni. Um, and I track her as well, um, and how she finds freedom. And I think what I try to do is to remind the readers that no matter the circumstance, you could have beautiful clothing and beds or what have you and be a, a slave of the Washingtons, that no matter who or what the situation was, freedom was always preferred. And that people were trying to find freedom however they could, by whatever means they could. Um, from 16, from the 1600s when slavery becomes legalized, first in Massachusetts, up until the Civil War. And I think in many ways, like I said before, Ona's story um, reminds us of that. It's not simply her life, but it's a narrative about the lives of black women and the trials and tribulations that women in particular dealt with because of notions of 18th century gentility and coverture and um, as, a, as a young black woman standing up to the president and then living her life as, as a free person is absolutely remarkable. And you know, when I have my moments, I've been on this book tour since February, you know, lots of travel and I'm tired and all that. 
Um, I have my moments when y'all miss a connecting flight or I'm not manhandled off of a flight. Um, I haven't had that experience yet. <laughs> not yet, although I'm flying United tomorrow, so we'll see. Um, you know, when I have these sort of difficult moments, I always sort of get myself together and say, okay, Erica, you have very 21st century issues. Um, <laughs> And, you know, if own a judge could be a fugitive for 50 years and make it happen, calm down about missing your flight. And, um, so, and, and so I think in many ways, own a story helps all of us to think about the goodness in people, the goodness in those who are here in New Hampshire that helped her stay away from the Washingtons. It reminds us of the kind of the humanity of people. And I'll end with this. It also reminds us of the humanity in um, people like George Washington, who owned slaves. And it, you know, it wasn't my intention when I wrote this book. I'm not a Washington biographer. There are other people who do that, do it really well. I do a little bit of that here in the book, but that's not who I am as a scholar. Um, but what was very clear to me is that George Washington changed as well over time. And his feelings about holding slaves Changed. He was born into a slaveholding family. He purchased slaves on his own as he grew older, but he became increasingly uncomfortable with the notion of slaveholding. And he would write and talk to the Marquis de Lafayette and others, and he, there was a phrase he used, um, I wish you'd get quit of my Negroes, is one of the phrases that he used. And he always came up with reasons for why he couldn't do it, you know, that uh, he didn't want to separate slave families or marry in with Martha's slaves. And, um, you know, so there were reasons that um, he gave for why he wouldn't emancipate his slaves. But at the end of George Washington's life, in his will, he does manumit his enslaved men and women. And so he, I argue he does in death what he couldn't or wouldn't do in life. And he states in his will that upon the death of Martha, he would emancipate, his slaves were to be emancipated. I don't know, Martha realizes, okay, so the only thing standing in between these people's freedom is my life, so perhaps I should emancipate these people early. And she does, right? She, she expedites that process, you know, otherwise she's sleeping like this for the rest of her life. There were some suspicious fires in Mount Vernon. She was nervous, she wrote to her friends, I'm nervous, I'm uncomfortable about these people, they're looking at me, you know. So she sets them free. She emancipates them early, but she never emancipates any enslaved person that she owns. So upon her death, all of the enslaved, including Ona's family, because remember, they're dower slaves, none of them were emancipated by Martha. They were all divided up, and what I did was I traced and followed all of the enslaved who went to the different grandchildren, including Ona's immediate family. Um, and so there's some argument, well, she, oh, Martha couldn't emancipate those people. They were part of an estate that was to be passed down to her grandchildren. Well, she changed George Washington's will, right? And no one said anything about that. And plus, she had purchased at least one person outright who she also did not emancipate. And it shows us the, difference, the different opinions in a family between a husband and a wife about slavery. And what I'll say is this, George Washington had no biological children. So there was no one expecting an inheritance, right? There's no one, there's no son, there's no daughter. He had nephews and cousins and what have you that inherited things. But I wonder if George Washington, if it would have been as easy as it was for him to emancipate his slaves had he had a son expecting over a hundred enslaved people. That's a tremendous amount of wealth that he basically turned over, gave away. But I do think it's important that what we see with all of these people, with George Washington, with Ona Judge in particular, as we see these humanity, we see people change and grow and develop over time, and it makes this complicated story of slavery and freedom more tangible, more understandable, and what I wanted to do was to show the humanity of people, the evils of slavery, but also um, the, the tremendous amount of hope that people like Ona Judge and others 
um, held on to for, for the entirety of their lives. Mm -hmm. So thank you.